out by giving you a, a brief overview of some of our hotels and hospitality and construction research that's really talking about some, some themes. And the reason I have hotel capital markets uh, uh, listed first is it's, it's really been um, a primary focus of the industry, uh, particularly as you've all heard about interest rates changing and so forth. But uh, first and foremost, hotel transaction activity is up 69% year to date over 2019, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, another area that um, owners and investors are really increasingly interested in is ESG environmental sustainability and government governance. And, and so uh, owners and operators really are looking for cost savings on one side, but also long-term asset preservation and enhancement. Um, the rising debt costs have created some volatility and some suppression on the short-term short transaction activity, but there's record dry powder, meaning there's a lot of money out there uh, looking to invest. And hotel, um, uh, assets are really attractive to many uh, investors. Um, the macroeconomic uncertainty has um, been, you know, a little tough, but year to date, uh, August Revpar reached an all time high. So that's great news for the industry. Um, private equity continues to be the largest acquirer of assets, but REITs and other lower leveraged buyers are starting to be more active. And, and you'll see some of the, you know, some of the uh, existing owners are strategically looking at ways to either offload certain assets uh, and, and concentrate on others or uh, look at strategic acquisitions. And we'll hear more about that from some of our panelists. U.S. supply growth is uh, forecasted to be at an all-time low, meaning that new builds are really uh, more difficult to get in the ground and to get financed and to get built. So it really is putting more of a focus on existing assets, changing hands, reposition, and so forth. And then portfolio activity is rebounding. Uh, there's been two um, trades over a billion dollars, and then of course the recent acquisition by Brookfield of uh, $3.8 billion for Watermark. Uh, this is, I'm just going to show you, you know, just briefly, this kind of uh, outlines that new hotels are taking double the amount of time, as I mentioned, uh, relative to pre-COVID, driven by supply chain and rising construction costs. So investment dollars are gravitating toward acquisitions rather than new builds. Um, I think, you know, what you should see here is that a hotel that is fully renovated is achieving uh, much better REVPAR premium than ones that are not. And average ADRs are also much higher. So that deferred maintenance and, and lack of CapEx is top of mind for hotel owners and operators as ADR continues to rise. And, and it's always the challenge as ADR is rising, you know, um, thinking about displacement, et, et cetera, uh, compared to the, the disruption that comes from uh, a project in your operating hotel. On uh, some future factors affecting your projects uh, along the way, um, construction material costs, some of them are down modestly, but many component prices and lead times remain uh, volatile. We recently I issued our second half 2022 construction outlook report, and um, you know some of these are you'd see in that report. Con consultants are spread thin, drawing coordination sometimes is suffering. Uh, just because uh, staffing and labor is uh, difficult. FF&E lead times, FF&E is critical path on every project, uh, as we know, and so uh, quality control issues uh, are, are another thing. Strains on budget, schedule, durations, and CapEx cycles. I mean, it's, a lot of it is about managing expectations with um, you know, all, all the stakeholders on a project because projects are taking longer. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges is the capacity of skilled design and construction labor. So we're seeing that across the board. It's, uh, you know, we're at record low unemployment and it's tough, you know, it's one thing to find people to fill the jobs, it's uh, another to find the skilled labor to do the work. So that creates some challenges in the field. And then uh, construction activity is elevated, but we're seeing architectural billings uh, growth slowing. So at the bottom, you'll see just some normal, uh, some overall trends. Co total construction costs um, 
uh, 10 to 14 percent increase, material costs 12 to 18 percent, labor costs 6 to 8 percent. There's some year-to-date numbers that are looking a little more favorable uh, than some of these, but we see uh, these trends continuing. So I thought I'd do that to set the table before we launch into some of the, the panel questions. Uh, and here we are once again with our panel. Um, and we're not going to go through uh, detailed introductions. I think they speak for themselves. We've got a great uh, cross-section of owners and brands, uh, at which I think will really um, uh, put this forward. And, and we've tried to put the questions up on the screen so you'll, you'll be able to see yourself and you won't have to uh, strain to hear. So I'm going to start out, uh, Rado and Christina, with, uh, with the proliferation of new brands, the trend towards soft brands, and the heightened competition from companies like Airbnb. What impact are these trends having on your hotel projects, and how is your approach different if the hotel is a hard brand, a soft brand, or fully independent? Um, sure, I'll, I'll start out. First, thanks for having us, and nice to see you guys all. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get anywhere close to the performance last night, so um, <laughs> we, we ask for some mercy. Um, hear me out. Uh, I, I know I, I will be uh, accused of ignorance with my answer, but um, I don't think we're comparing apples to apples. Um, uh, Airbnb obviously is a force on the market that impacts the entire industry, but at the same time, um, we're talking about two different products. Um, I renovated my kitchen. I didn't stop, start, uh, stop going to restaurants, right? Um, I still go to restaurants. Um, same, same thing with hotels and, and Airbnb. Um, hotels are providing experiences versus Airbnb is more of a, uh, a place if you're traveling with, with family and so on. Um, but speaking of hotels and the experiences, what the brands are doing, and especially self brands uh, within the, at least within our portfolio, is that Hotels are no longer, as we all know, places to just spend the night. Um, whether it's co-working spaces, whether it's workstations throughout the, uh, uh, the property, whether it's uh, specialty meetings, uh, hybrid meetings, um, uh, curated uh, food and beverage experiences, um, it's a completely different story. At the same time, if you're traveling with a large family and you want to be alone and you want to control everything that uh, is happening during your, your vacation, um, you'll, be, you'll be staying at an at a, um, uh, Airbnb type of property. And that's why all the brands, I'm pretty sure, are now uh, jumping on that wagon, including Marriott. And we have the Marriott uh, Homes and Villas, right. um, where you can also benefit from collecting points, using points, uh, boing boing points, and so on. So I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I don't think they're, they're overlapping. Um, Chris, they're complementing each other. I know, you know Highgate has a tremendous amount of lifestyle hotels and so forth. What, what, what do you have to add to Well, first of all, I agree with Rado, and, and also thank you for having us today. Um, I think you know ha the proliferation, the number of brands, independent, soft, um, and portfolio collections is great. Um, as a designer, I love it because there's a lot more creativity that you can kind of bring to the table. And I think that, uh, you know, the guest is also looking for that kind of unique, um, authentic experience. And, and to Rado's point, experience is an important word. Um, and the way that you stay at an Airbnb type property, because I agree everybody's getting into the space, it is smart, or we are too, um, that, you know, it's one way to stay in a hotel, whether it's a full service luxury, lifestyle, independent brand, it is another way to stay from that. But you know, you, you, you're looking for something different. I think a lot of people are looking for something different. And w where I stay or want to stay in a place like you know, Boston you know, might be different from how or what I want to stay if I'm going to visit in a, re a resort in Hawaii. And so having product that caters to that variation and has that local feel, I think is extremely important and a wonderful evolution in terms of where we are in design and in, in brands. And so it creates a lot of choices uh, for the yes. consumer, but also a lot of interest uh, as owners and operators. Exactly. I'm going to go on to uh, 
you know, a real concern that we've been seeing, and I'm going to address this to Brett and Carl. Although the industry is experiencing concerns about material and labor cost increases, supply chain issues, market escalation, interest rate volatility, and political instability, um, transaction for hotels has been robust. How are your firms dealing with these issues, and what impact are they having on the planning for future projects? Yeah, I, I think um, for us it's been a challenging time. You know, we, we went from the lows of 2020, where nothing was happening, to two years later being as robust as we've ever been, whether it's, you know, you mentioned new transactions of hotels, but even on, for our, for our company, uh, we've got two brand new projects, um, new build projects being built right now, in addition to a massive $150 million renovation at the, at the homestead. Uh, we've got more activity now than we did probably pre-pandemic. And a lot of those jobs were bought at the right time. So I think the key is planning well in advance um, and then following through with, um, you know, looking to see where you, you take those projects next. And, and the, the, the issue for us is, you know, future projects. Right now, nothing uh, it makes sense from the construction side, right? I mean, just the, you, you're seeing 20, 30% cost increase from two years ago. So for us, it's all about timing. Um, we hit it right uh, with the projects we have on the ground now, kind of waiting to see what happens over the next, you know, six, eight months. A lot of talk about recession coming. Um, we're not seeing any signs of that, and I'm sure you guys are doing the same. So just plan, 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 and then also uh, partnering with um, contractors, some contractors early. Um, we found that to be super key. So when we hire an uh, architectural firm to start our projects, we also hire our contractors and, and usually subcontractors as well. So getting out in front of that so, so, uh, supply chain issues as well. And you can lock them in. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Carl, what, what are you seeing? I echo everything that Brett said. And um, I would add a few things. Number one, it's really important to have team syndicates. And these team syndicates are people that you've developed long-term relationships with that know you during the good times and the bad times, so that when you get into a pickle on a project, you've got people that you can look across the table from and manage and navigate through that situation. Um, but I would say stay with the fundamentals. The fundamentals are starting projects earlier, getting the best teams possible, making sure you have contingency. I can't um, emphasize the importance of having construction contingency, and this is what happens when you're in the middle of a project. And then escalation. Escalation is what happens between the time you think about a project to the time you start. So those two buckets um, are critical. And it took um, a pandemic for our team to really educate our, our leadership and our board on the importance of project contingency. It used to be called fat, yeah. but, now <laughs> but now it's called a necessity. So I would say those are the, the things I would sort of hype uh, focus on. And then with regards to locking projects in, like we started projects six, nine months earlier than we typically did. And our, our strategy is really to have shelf-ready projects. So when the opportunity presents itself, um, we're ready. The last point I'll make is that um, our portfolio, I mean, we're park hotels and resorts. We own um, probably we're the second largest hospitality REIT. And when you look at our assets, they're old. They need attention. So for us, this is an exciting time. So it's really important to have the fundamentals, stay focused, stay ready, so that when capital is ready, we're ready to go ahead and proceed. I, I, I would imagine it's pretty hard to prioritize some of those projects uh, when you only have you know, a, a limited amount of funds or resources and you have to figure out which ones. No, 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 no not at all. No? Uh, we've, um, you know, we've been really proactive during the pandemic. So when um, in 2020, 2021, we went through every asset. We identified every ROI project. We put them in rank based on internal rates of return. And so we were able to prioritize them. So when capital presents itself, we're now ready to proceed. And for assets that where the returns were really low, those didn't really fit our portfolio. So we sold those. Uh, very strategic in, in, in approach. And actually, for the first time in a long time, you really have the, had the time the time. Uh, to really focus on strategy. The, the time and the syndicates, I can't emphasize the um, importance of having really good cost estimators, really good contractor relationships, really good designers, really good interior people, FF&E people. You can collaborate. So during 2020 and 2021, you know, we were planning. We were trying to figure out 
okay, like, we're contrarians. We know the market's coming <laughs> back. When it comes back, we want to be ready to pounce. And as a result, I think it put us in a really good position. That's great. Well, um, going from uh, that uh, area, I wanted to talk about the um, addressing the owner's perspective regarding working with the brand. Uh, this is for Carl, Rado, and Brett. You know, um, Brett, you're both a, a brand and an owner. Um, and Carl, you know, you've come from both sides, and and uh, now you're. Uh, you know, really, the ownership group and are working with the brands. And Rado, you're the you're you know the, the representative of the biggest brand there is. So, um, what during the pandemic, brands understood the difficulties owners were having in making debt service and covering expenses during closures. Have the brands returned to enforcing pips on sale or long overdue renovations? And if so, what are the biggest challenges and where are the biggest opportunities in the owner and brand relationship? And Carl, we could start with you, and then we can. Uh, have Moretto and Brett uh, kind of weigh in. Yeah, the, so the biggest challenge is always capital. And it's the cost of capital and then how do you deploy it? So, you know, during the pandemic, we were in a situation where, um, or pre-pandemic, we generated 2.6 billion in revenue. Um, 2020, 2021, we lost a billion dollars. So as a result, you know, capital was at a premium. So, you know, we were really fortunate to have great relationships with the brands between Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, Intercontinental, and we went to them as, as partners. <coughs> we were able to sort of talk through, you know, how, you know, we could collaborate to renovate the things that were important to them to maintain their sort of brand equity, but at the same time maintain ownership equity. And I would say the, the biggest challenge was capital. I would say collaboration was the key to get through that sort of turbulent time. And then with regards to biggest opportunities, I mean, we, unfortunately, you know, our focus is really clear. We focus on hard brands. So we don't have soft brands or independent. So this brand relationship is critical to us. And as a result, you know, we see our, our interests sort of totally aligned. And as a result, it's been really easy to navigate um, some of the challenges that we encountered during the pandemic and then on a go-forward basis. Rado, uh, how has it been for you as a brand working with the different ownership groups, you know, including, you know, uh, Park and others? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's not a secret for anybody. What the pandemic did to the industry was probably worse than 9-11 and 2008 combined. So the first thing we did as a brand um, when this whole thing uh, unfolded, uh, we came up we need. We know. We knew that we needed to address the concerns and the financial strains that our ownerships are um, experiencing. So uh, we did a number of things. One of them is uh, our trip uh, program, which is the temporary renovation investment uh, program, and um, the purpose was to um, help ownerships. Um, manage their renovations and their cycle, due cycles and so on without actually impacting the guest experience. So in order to do this, we had to actually um, take a number of things into account, including the GSS, including the physical condition of the property. That worked out great and a lot of properties actually um, took advantage and a lot of ownership groups uh, took advantage of this, uh, of this program. Now is uh, we're back to um, RefPAR and thank you. We're back to RefPAR and ADR of uh, pre-pandemic levels, if not if not uh, higher. So with that said, all these renovations are now coming due together with the the cycle renovations and the pips that are just on on uh, on time. Um, and to your point earlier about the lack of skilled labor, whether it's on the design side or the construction side, this is going to be very interesting, in my opinion, in the next year or so. And I think the best thing that uh, owners can do is start early and plan for delays, because whether it's case good manufacturing or interior design firms, it will be interesting uh, because it will be overwhelming. And it's not just us, all the, all the big brands have done something similar. Um, so 
this, this delay will create the bottleneck, in my opinion, in the next couple of well, years. Well, I think it really reinforces what Carl said about picking your partners early and trying to lock them in. And what Brett had uh, said, you know, even with your construction subcontractor uh, community. Brett, do you have anything to add, being a brand and an owner? Um, yeah, we, we kind of set our own pace, uh, and that was even before the pandemic. So we kind of pick and choose what hotels we think need renovations. We're not on a seven, eight, 10 year cycle, uh, which is great for us. Um, so we, we, you know, we hurt like everybody else did. We went from, we were close to that $2 billion number as well, uh, but the pandemic happened. We were lucky if we made five, I think 500 million that year. So we were, you know, we, but we were a lot more able to kind of uh, jump through and do a lot of things that helped us reduce our costs early. Um, and that's on the operation side, but even on the construction side, things that we were, um, you know, had planned, we were able to pull back a little bit until we knew what the world looked like. And that's, you know, we, we, you know, we talked about PIPs and, and renovations. We were able to jump and take advantage of those costs when they dipped in 2020, because we knew as everybody, we, the world was going to come back, right? We, and we know it goes through cycles. We knew something, you know, we knew today was going to be the day, right? We knew that it was going to come. So I think having that flexibility and that ability uh, for us to plan renovations when we, we, we see need to and also where we need to. In addition to that, we also sold assets in the pandemic um, that we knew no matter how much we spent on the renovation would never lift rates. So it was through the pandemic that actually helped us, like Carl said, strategically go through our assets and make sense of what, uh, what made sense for us to renovate and move on. So we learned a lot through the pandemic um, as a company, and we'll, we'll hopefully take those for the next foreseeable future as well. Right, right. Good discussion. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, mergers and acquisitions. We've all seen in the industry there's been a lot over the last several years. Marriott, Starwood, Park, Chesapeake, Accor, Fairmont, Ennismore, Hyatt, Two Roads, Apple, Wyndham, La Quinta. What impact is this phenomenon having on your business and more specifically on projects? Do you see this industry consolidation continuing and is it good for the industry? So Carl and Ratto, I think I'll, I'll check in with you on this. Awesome. Um, I think our company, we believe in consolidation. Um, as I think about you know, my personal journey, in 2011, I worked for a company called RLJ Lodging Trust. And at that time, we identified a great partner in Felcor, and we merged with them. Because at that time, our CEO really thought that there were too many actors in this space, there was opportunities to create value, and you needed sort of the good partnership between two different companies to sort of create that solid partnership where you could add some value. So that was 2016 merger. Um, and then Park, Park spun out in 2017, took all of Hilton's real estate, and then um, ended up merging with Chesapeake. So from a corporate perspective, we believe that consolidation is necessary for the industry. We think it's good for the industry. So now, how is it good for the industry? Yeah. It's good for the industry because when you look at portfolios, some of the portfolios are compliant with strategy, some are non-compliant with strategy. Some have hair, some don't have hair. And I'll use our portfolio at Park as an example. When we merge with um, Chesapeake, you know, we consumed all of their real estate. When we spun out from Hilton, we consumed all of their real estate. Um, over the last five years, we've sold over 33 assets for over $2 billion. Those sales were a function of joint ventures, international assets, assets that really weren't compliant, that the entities by themselves couldn't really get to the work, but as a focused merged entity, we could really get to the work. And I think there's been a lot of value that's been created now. The, the stock market may not give us credit right now, but I think over time it will. But we think you know consolidation is necessary. We think it's good for the industry. We think it provides focus for the assets and the opportunities within the assets. Well, and, and Rado, I know there, you know, so many people will say like, how many brands is too many? You know, there's been so much consolidation. You know, how do you differentiate between, you know, you know, a Sheridan and a, you know, full service Marriott and, and, and all the other things with all this consolidation? So what does Marriott think? I get asked this question a lot. So I'm going to take a quick poll. Any competitive swimmers in the audience? There's one. All right. That's not good because um, I'm going to butcher some terms right now. But... <laughs> um, 
because I'm not a swimmer. Um, so the, the US uh, rule book uh, for swimming, which is consistent with the international rules, um, says that uh, as long as a swimmer starts and finishes a race in the same lane, it's okay. And during the race, it's totally okay to cross over in another lane unless you interfere or obstruct the other swimmers. And then it's up to the referee whether they will disqualify you or not. But as long as you start and you finish in the same lane, you're good. So the way I see it, the swim lanes are the brands, the swimmers are the ownership and the designers, and um, the referees are the guests. And as long as we start and finish the race in the right lane, I think we'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> Great analogy. Uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, ESG. As I mentioned in, in the earlier trends, in environmental sustainability and governance um, has been really critical. And so all that, though many brands have put a focus on it, many owners are reluctant to include these elements in their projects because there's a perception that it costs too much or it's not important. Are you as owners and brands increasing your focus and commitment to ESG? And if so, what are some of the biggest areas where you're moving the needle and why? I'll start with you, Christina, and then Carl and Rado, well, uh, you can jump in. Sure, well, uh, you know, Highgate is uh, owner and operator. So it does give us a, a unique ability to really sort of make an impact on both. And, and we do, I, you know, I think Everyone needs to have a commitment towards sustainability. I don't think we have a choice not to. Um, and that's the way, you know, the upper leadership at Highgate feels as well. So as, um, you know, operator, uh, especially in, uh, for most of our portfolio and especially in our select service, um, pretty much all of the energy is uh, renewable energy sourcing and, uh, for those properties. So right now we're, we're buying most of that from, you know, like, like in the, a lot of our properties in Las Vegas and other in the desert areas, it's all in the solar panels there. Um, in our urban markets, you know, there's not really the real estate on the roof of the building to put a solar panel in, but that's definitely something we're looking forward to. So on the operation side, it's very important to, uh, you know, try to reduce plastic where we can. You know, we try to, um, you know, have water stations in the hotels and refillable vessels. And I think the guest is looking for that too. Um, that does require a little bit of commitment on the ownership side. So when we're doing a development, you know, now you've got to put that water station in. You know, that is a little bit of, of money to put that in. But, you know, overall, I do think it's not, you know, to even use the term trend is like the wrong word, but it is something as a community, the world community, I think we all need to do. And I do think it is what the guests expect. And, and uh, honestly, investors are uh, increasingly expecting it because major yes. corporations are putting uh, a huge emphasis on it for their employees, for their customers, et cetera. And so they're making decisions on where they're going to send their meetings uh, for those uh, companies and owners that are making that commitment. Uh, Carl, I know this is something you're passionate about as well. Uh, can you add in from Park's perspective? Absolutely. I don't have a uh, swimming analogy, though. <laughs> um, you, you know, ESG, ESG is, is about really <clears throat> driving excellence at the environmental level and at the performance level. And our company has really been focused on ESG before it became popular. Um, if you pull up our corporate responsibility report, it'll show you that you know, as we look at environmental, you know, we have every time there's a building system that's going to get replaced, we take the opportunity to take that building system and take it upstream from an efficiency perspective. We're going to spend the dollars anyway, so it's a matter of taking that premium, underwriting that premium, and then what we have found is that when you um, buy energy efficient equipment, it goes right to the bottom line. It goes there quickly. Yeah. With regards to um, the audits, we go through our entire portfolio on an annual basis and we do building audits and those building audits result in projects that, you know, add efficiency. And then on a capital basis, we set aside between five and $10 million on an annual basis just for energy improvements. And with regards to sustainability, 
you know, we look from our board to our CEO, all the way down to, you know, senior management to the operations. You know, there's a clear focus around sustainability. And as Christina mentioned, like, mm. we don't have time right now to really waste with regards to cleaning up the environment, you know, looking at projects from a sustainability perspective. And I'll give you two case studies really quick. We own the uh, Waldorf Casa Marina in Key West. It has a 750,000 gallon cistern. We use that water that we collect in that cistern for all of our irrigation. It cuts down on our water consumption and we also use gray water as well. The second um, case study I'll share really quickly is our Hyatt Mission Bay. When we talk about moving the needle. We did a building audit there. We saw an opportunity to do an LED project. That LED project ended up saving approximately 35% of kilowatt consumption and reduced our energy consumption by 45%. Which is remarkable, Thanks. yeah. Um, Rado, uh, from Marriott's perspective, I know that you've put a big focus on ESG, and it's not just the environmental sustainability, but on the governance side, on uh, because labor is such a challenge for the hotel industry of diversity and inclusion and, and employee satisfaction of, of uh, retaining employees and, and attracting employees. Absolutely, and um, I think collectively in this room, probably, um, the companies that we represent here, um, we touch 60 to 70 dollars of every hundred dollars that are spent in, in hotels in the US and Canada. Um, and I think we carry a strong responsibility because of it. And it goes beyond, uh, as you said, David, uh, beyond sustainability, it goes into human rights and it goes into uh, community service and it goes into um, the, uh, the, the families of all the associates uh, on properties, above properties, and so on. Um, so Marriott has the 360, um, uh, Surf 360 program, which is doing good all, all around. And uh, in addition to sustainability and sustainable operations, it, it does include goals uh, aligned with the United Nations um, human rights goals and sustainability goals as well. And um, uh, they are all, uh, they have targets every five years. The next, uh, the next set of targets is 2025. And um, uh, one of the examples just announced last week, uh, we worked with the um, US business, su business Summit for Refugees and committed to hiring 1,500 refugees uh, by 2025. Um, and that's uh, together with uh, another 40 companies uh, around, the, around the country, um, the total commitment is over 20,000 refugees that will be hired by 2025. Uh, so it goes, it goes all the way um, back to, uh, to people and to the communities. And, and I, I, I can't emphasize enough that it really is coming from the investor suite as well, that, that they're really paying attention on you know, when you are going out to finance a project or whatever, the, there are, are some investors that won't do it if you're not committed. Carl, you Yeah, I was just gonna, I was gonna highlight the point you just made, which is as an officer of PARC, you know, we um, on a quarterly basis have to provide earnings calls. And after each earnings call, there's always a handful of investors who wanna talk about ESG. And they wanna talk about it in detail. And they want to understand what your plans and your goals are, and then how is it measured. So this is something that we're seeing from a shareholder-based perspective. They're really putting a fine focus on it, and it's really a directive yeah. that you will, you know, have an ESG program. You will have goals. Now, whether they're published or not, you know, we're still working through that. Right. But the fact of the matter is, you have to have a, a, a narrow focus on ESG. The second point that I wanted to highlight was on our ecosystem. And this is all of our vendors. Everyone who is part of a park project, you know, has to comply with our ESG program as well. Just wanted to share. No, that's that's great. The women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, we're very focused on making sure there's opportunity across the landscape. That's terrific. I, and I think you know you'll all see that this is a topic that's going to be front and center going forward, and so you can't um, discount it as as. Uh, just a would be nice. Right. I think it's really going to be uh, something that you all need to consider in your businesses. Um, 
Going on to um, another topic, uh, Brett and Christina, leisure and leisure, the blending of business and leisure travel have led the way during the difficult recovery from the pandemic. The return to work drive by some corporations have hoteliers wondering well, when to expect a robust return to corporate business travel as well. And we've all heard, you know, uh, the likes of Google pulling back a little bit or, or others. What industry sectors or locations are you focusing your attention on as you look to the future and why? You know, luxury, select service, resort, urban lifestyle, geographic location. Uh, Brett, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think um, in 2021, resorts kind of pulled us through the, the tough times. Uh, this year, Group Association of Business is back, um, pretty much at 2019 levels. The one segment that hasn't is business travel. I think a lot of that is work from home. Um, a lot of that is just, um, I think, people trying to figure out you know, what this looks like uh, in 2022 and beyond. We do think that next year, if recession doesn't um, um, you know, blow this up, BT will return. Uh, we're not a, we're, we're, our group is more focused on leisure uh, with all the resort that we have in the portfolio, as well as uh, group. Uh, but BT is a big part of a business. So the areas you look to, obviously the big ones, New York City, LA, um, you look to Atlanta. Uh, those markets, Charlotte, um, those are kind of the key markets for the BT travel. Um, but you know, we we do have we see some headwinds on the two that I mentioned. So you look at um, the dollar. Dollar is very strong. You look at Europe and other countries are opening up business again. So we think the resort leisure is going to take a hit in the next couple of years because of that. Um, you know, you look at group. We hope that remains strong. But we're we're really looking to BT to come back strong. Otherwise, um, you know, we're going to be you know not not as bad as we were in 2020, but certainly not as good as we're looking this year. So. Christina, what are you seeing? Uh, well, we're actually pleasantly surprised. The last two quarters did pretty well on uh, corporate business. Uh, we opened uh, the Newberry Hotel in Boston and the Park Lane Hotel in New York just recently. So two sort of major urban market properties in, in the luxury sector. So, you know, and they're, they're doing very well, uh, holding uh, rate and occupancy. So it's, it's you know, generally speaking, well, it's not all the way back to where it was. We're doing quite well. But, of course, we also, and probably most people know, we made a major acquisition of a large select service portfolio during the course of the pandemic. So um, that was anticipated to, uh, you know, recover quickest. And so that's where, you know, our, our leadership team, you know, made that investment. Um, but we, you know, we're extremely diversified, you know, and so we have now, we do have some resort properties more than we used to, but not like we didn't ever have them. They were there. We've been invested in Hawaii for a long time, but we uh, just recently, relatively recently required a really wonderful resort property in Scottsdale that we're working on renovating. So, you know, overall the, the mantra is diversification and making sure we have all segments um, and, you know, reaching into Europe and wherever else we might be going. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's pretty good in terms of the corporate, uh, specifically to the question. I think the big group houses, you know, I mean, I know, Carl, you've got quite a few of those. Those are, have been a challenge uh, in, you know, uh, filling businesses. But I know just personally, you know, this year we finally came together for, you know, a major meeting where we brought 400 people together, it was like such a refreshing return to reality of seeing people face to face mm -hmm. instead of on a Zoom call or a Teams call. Um, are, are you seeing some group business come back? Absolutely. I mean, as I, as I look at the segmentation, the, um, you know, BT, as Brett said, it's struggling. But the groups, they're coming back strong, much stronger than we had forecasted at the beginning of the year. The second thing is, as you look around the room, I mean, as you mentioned, it's refreshing to sort of see the faces and see the smiles. And, you know, I ran into Rob Carl at breakfast this morning and hadn't seen Rob since, you know, way back when. So it's, it's refreshing, and I think people need that. I think that will drive the sort of return to work. Um, as you look at the group boxes, and our portfolio is big box conference center, resort. That's the two segments that we sort of play in. And we think that the, the need to connect the need for retraining, reacclimation, reestablishment of culture. And culture is a thing that stops everybody from being a consultant. 
I mean, people have to sort of be, bleed blue at a certain level. And in order to do that, you need to reestablish culture. You need to be in person. You need to touch and talk and, and train. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving on a little bit, uh, we ta we've talked uh, quite a bit about this. The industry has experienced increased labor challenges in both the design and construction side as well as ongoing operations. How are you addressing these challenges, and are you tailoring your hotel designs to maximize labor efficiency in both the construction trades and ongoing operations? And do you believe there will be more innovations to relieve the pressure? And so Carl and Brett, I, th I thought uh, I'd address this to you. Awesome. I think innovation is critical. As you look at sort of, if you compare um, a guest experience 2022 from 2017, you know, the PDA wasn't as strong. Guest preferences really weren't known. Um, it was a very hands-on experience and not very customized. In 2022, it's very customized. You bypass the front desk, you pick your room, you pick the type of room, you pick the experience, you can curate your experience. So I think for us, it's been really important to hear what the guests are saying, to understand the segmentation within the guest profile, to make sure that the designers are really focused on understanding the guest preferences, working with the brands to make sure that we are aligned with regards to uh, what the brand standards are versus what the guests are asking for, and then to make sure that the design itself is the uh, synthesis of those metrics sort of coming together. As I look out into the future, I think innovation will continue with machine learning, with AI, with guest preferences, starting to continue to involve but the need to be together. And as Christine and I, we had sort of a side discussion a minute ago about the necessity to sort of come back to work. I think you know, innovation is the bridge. It's the bridge between sort of you know, where we are today and what the guests are gonna to need tomorrow. And innovation is, I think, what, is what's gonna get us there. Yeah, take a little different approach uh, to the question. I, labor, um, is one of our biggest challenges in the design and construction, particularly the construction industry as a whole. I don't think it's really much different than uh, the operation side on the hotel side. It's very much the same. Um, if you look at construction over the last you know, 100, 200 years, there's been very little innovation when you really think about our industry compared to others. Um, I think it's right for it. I'm a big proponent of uh, 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 standardization of stuff, but more importantly, of prefabrication. If you can take what you do in the field and put it in the factory, um, it cuts down on labor hours tremendously. Um, I think there's also opportunities even in the field when it comes to technology. And I don't think it's been tapped at all. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that have to change, I think, over the next 10, 20 years for us to continue down the pace we're going. Now, we talk about ho hotel construction, but you know we're only one part of the industry. Um, the industry is very robust when it comes to the amount of work, thus the construction increased cost you're seeing. Um, so if we don't figure out something here soon, our labor uh, sources continue to go down, um, but our spend continues to go up. So something's got to give at some point. We've got to figure out how to get uh, more technology into what we do. Otherwise, we'll, we're going we're to be challenged. Well, I, and I think that really ties into productivity because uh, it, it really is the skilled labor. So if you can take uh, a piece of that out of the equation and have it in a, a factory where it's a little more exacting and so forth, and then train the employees in the field to uh, adapt and, and install it in a different way, that, that obviously is an interesting we, approach. We did bathroom pods in our uh, Omni Louisville project, and it was amazing because you install it and you forget about it because you don't have to punch it, it's done. It, it's, it's quite amazing. We did the same thing in Orlando for the uh, KPMG Lakeside campus. It was 800 rooms. We manufactured all the bathrooms off site, uh, brought them to the site. And now, it, that's a whole nother, you know discussion about modular construction, but it was really modular construction in component parts, not necessarily in the entire exactly. guest room. And that's, a, you know, that's a, another area that you could look at. Hey, David, before you move on, I'm curious, were those renovations, were those new construction? With new pods? construction. New construction. So this is the, yeah. the, the problem. You know, we do a lot of renovations and repositionings. And um, it's not new, but, you know, definitely trying to put more on the FF&E and having it look more architectural. Really, right. 
um, getting clever with how you do it. So it's a similar approach, you know, but it's obviously a little bit different. And then in the room itself, really trying to reduce well, the actual I mean, construction you know, labor. Complete guest room vanities, including the sink and the exactly. bright work and all that kind of stuff is being right. manufactured by, you know, furniture manufacturers yeah. and, and, and brought in and, and connected yeah. by the plumbing. And all the electrical all be built in. But even, you know, paneling on the walls and different things that, you know, somebody would walk in and think, you know, this is architectural millwork and that was actually done uh, in a factory. Yeah. 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 I think, David, I'd like to add one other yeah. point. Um, with regards to um, construction and looking at the labor comment that Brent mentioned earlier, uh, we're in the process now of building out a $110 million uh, uh, ballroom project in Bonnet Creek. And, you know, we're working with our contractor, Whiting Turner, who's been fabulous. And, you know, they've got a, a protege program, which is really helping train the next and, generation. The next generation. Mm -hmm. And we see that as a, as a requirement on a go-forward basis because, as you mentioned, you know, the, the skilled craftsmen, they're retiring. They're falling out of the system. So we've got to backfill them. So I just wanted to make that point. No, I think that's great. That's a great point. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, technology because it is uh, clearly something that is um, ever-changing, front and center. Uh, so I'll address this to Arado and, and Christina initially, and anybody else can jump in. How are you keeping up with the ever-changing evolution of technology? Has the hospitality industry discovered the right balance between energy efficiency, costs, and guest comfort and convenience? Is it a moving target as technology and guest expectations are shifting? So I'll start with you, Rado. So yeah, technology, right? The, it's like fire. It can uh, heat your home or it can burn your house. So, <laughs> um, but, but here's the thing. I mean, who can, who, who can show me their, yeah. their seven-year-old iPhone? It's iPhone 6, if you're wondering. Anybody? <laughs> Seven-year-old laptop? Anybody? See, that's the problem. It's not, it's not that we don't understand technology. It's not that we don't understand what the guests are expecting going into a, a hotel room. It's timing. And the timing is we build hotels every once in a while. We renovate hotels every seven years and technology changes seven times a year. So we buy new phones every year, but we can put new technology in the rooms every year. So on property level, when we're talking about rooms and the guest-facing technology, um, it's, a tough, it's a tough game because you can't update the technology as often as we would like to see or as we update the technology in our homes. We buy a new Alexa every year, we buy a new TV every other year, and so on. Um, not, not the case on property. Um, at the same time, we can do things on property that are technology related, whether it comes to HVAC, whether it's efficiency. We have to stop, speaking of sustainability, we have to stop heating and cooling empty spaces. Right. Um, whether it's rooms or ballrooms, they're, they're empty, uh, I, I'm going to guess 60, 70 percent of the time on average. Um, they get heating, they get cooling, they get lighting. Um, and, and that's technology that's available, that's out there. And nobody should have any excuse not having motion or occupancy sensors in these spaces and um, actually reducing, reducing those, uh, um, uh, those costs and, and, uh, and energy use. Um, and at the same time, uh, the people in this room, I think the technology that we have to uh, be always on top of is whether it's design tools, whether it's um, uh, project management tools, we have zero excuse for those. Uh, I mean, we, we've done renovations that we never set foot at uh, over the last two years um, through VR, through uh, 360 cameras, through uh, tools that were um, sci-fi movie stuff three, four, five years ago, and now they're available, they're mainstream, a, a 360 camera is like $150 now, uh, and any, anybody can have it. Um, so I think it goes on multiple levels, uh, so we have, to be, uh, we have to be able to differentiate, but when it comes to guest-facing technology, um, the less permanent it is, the, 
the, the better we all are so that we can replace. I mean, remember a few years ago, the RJ45 jack at the, at the <laughs> desk in the room was like a state of the art thing. You don't have to dial up anymore. And, and now we, we went through USB and USB-C and who knows what the next USB will be. And uh, we still won't be able to keep up. And, right, right. And, and two years from now, it will look outdated when you walk into the room and it doesn't get renovated for another five, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, so to that point, having, the, the technology has also evolved, so now the technology rests with the guest. And so I'm coming to your hotel and I'm gonna play my Netflix queue off of my phone onto your TV. And so um, having that as sort of your infrastructure and your backbone has to be extremely robust, of course, and that's where we definitely focus our attention. Um, and sure, we can still offer some content, but by and large, it's guest own content within our room. And I think that is, um, it's, it's, you know, early in the days, I think people were nervous in the hotel industry because they would make money off of those movies that people would buy. But now, it, it's, it's, it's obsolete. It's obsolete, it's completely obsolete. And it, it doesn't matter. And so the guest is, it, it's, a, it's a better guest experience. You know, and I'm also a proponent, like the same thing, it's, you gotta keep it simple in the room too. You know, you don't have to walk into a new guest room and like, I don't know how to turn lights. You know, I, it's like, I gotta like, pull something out and figure it out and educate myself. I'm just here for a night. I don't wanna figure I just wanna turn out. the light on where my chair is so yeah. I can read. You exactly. Know. And, and, you know, maybe that dates me a little bit because I'm actually reading a book and not all like <laughs> that. But I, I do think that, you know, technology can be a, um, in, in just that way that Rado's talking about where it's, it's a wonderful thing and it can advance all of our lives and our experiences and it can add to sustainability to turn mechanical off. But it's like if I walk in my room and it's like stuffy, that's not good. If I can't figure out how to turn on the light switch, that's not good. So you have to really find that balance uh, between you know, embracing it and it being that, that bleeding edge, right? Well, and it's it's expensive uh, for the infrastructure. And Carl, I know you know that's yeah. something that I, I was I was just going to say. This is where Rado and I sort of get off on a bad foot because <laughs> like there's a there's a push pull between ownership and brands with regards to hospitality and technology. You think about um, having two Cat Six hardwired cables to every TV for a certain brand. It just doesn't make sense when we're headed into a wireless world. And I think those are the push-pulls that we need to continue to sort of have. Those are really good, robust discussions to make sure we're not getting into a place where we're wasting money for things that are going to change year over year. And the guest really doesn't care about it. Okay. So we've got to make sure there's a good balance there. I, I think that's a, a great point. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, a never-ending challenge to say, what are we going to include here and what's going to be relevant two years from now? And is the expense that we would put in uh, to, to doing it worth the challenge when it changes? Right. Um, this is, uh, you know, a little easier question for all, for all of you, I think, because, uh, you know, I'd like to go through and ask you what, you know, we have a lot of professionals that have been in the industry a long time here at this conference. Uh, you've been in the business for a long time in varying roles. Uh, what's the most fun aspect of your job? Brett, I'll start with you on, on your end. And, and it doesn't have to be just your job. I mean, your, your, you know, your job and, and how that intertwines with your life. Yeah, I, I think the funnest part um, is you get to see the fruits of your labor. So many times you're an accountant or uh, you name it, it's, it's hard to see the actual product of what you work so hard on. And, uh, for me, uh, we do a lot of new builds, even renovations, same thing. I almost, it, it, I won't quite equate it exactly the same as I've got two young kids, but it's almost like having a kid. And you get to see it grow and grow up and, and you, you defend it like it's your kid too. So it really, it, you get to kind of, your, your product is alive. It's, it's really great. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Brett. I think mine would be just seeing young people seeing young people grow, grow through a project, grow through a series of challenges that seem insurmountable from day one, but you learn the power of collaboration. And when you see the light bulb goes, go off, you know, that is a spark for me. Yeah, that's great. Christina? Well, just being selfish, you know, my funnest after my job is it's the travel, you know, I get to do. So working on these incredible 
projects and properties all over the country or the world, you know, takes me to places so I can, you know, be thinking about, you know, what's the right thing to do in Scottsdale, in Arizona, or the right thing to do in Portland, Maine. Um, and uh, so it's just kind of constantly changing and, um, you know, investigation and discovery of all these different places. Plus, um, you know, I get to travel there and sometimes my husband will come along and we make a little bit longer weekend out of it and sort of blend the two, uh, the bleasure. Idea. The bleasure aspect, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rado? Um, I, like probably a um, few people in this room, I didn't grow up in hospitality. I was in other parts of the design world um, for the first half of my life. Uh, but I have to say, um, the, the best, the fun, the, the most fun part about this industry is the people. Um, it's like no other. Uh, the, the relationships, the, the friendships, the collaboration, um, we work differently because it's the only industry that actually has a brand included in the whole equation between ownership and design and um, being able to bridge that gap and being able to uh, work on both sides of the equation is actually uh, the most um, exciting thing for me. I think, uh, you know, for me, you know, so much of this business is experiential, whether it is uh, the work that we do, the people that we interact with, the fact that you can bring your family back to a project that you were involved with and they can experience it and somehow understand like, dad, what do you really do? You know, I mean, <laughs> have you ever gotten that question, Carl? <laughs> like, and, uh, totally. and so, you know, this is, you know, I, I always say it's all about hospitality in, in whatever we are doing, uh, it's really linked. And we're seeing from JLL's perspective that hospitality has, is having a huge impact beyond the hotel industry. I mean, whether it's healthcare, whether it's the office environment, trying to attract people to come back to work and all the amenity spaces that are really very hotel-like. Uh, you know, hospitals, the same thing. Um, everything from residential and other. So, you know, this industry is very dynamic and it's really, you know, bleeding beyond the hotel industry. Uh, and to me, that's kind of fun to, to see the impact that, that hospitality is having across the board in our lives and in our work lives. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, uh, this has been a wonderful dynamic uh, discussion, a great uh, panel. Uh, Brett, Carl, Cristino, Rado, uh, thank you very much. Please uh, join me in, in thanking them uh, for a great discussion. <laughs>